Our next speaker is Claire Morris. Claire has uh, been a physiotherapist for nearly 30 years, and she's worked in many areas, including paediatric intensive care, general in and out patient services and private practice. For the last year, 18 years, she's worked in rehabilitation at RGH. She's uh, participated in numerous research trials as a co-investigator two, for two current RCTs and has experience in the implementation and development of various rehabilitation settings, including rehabilitation in the home, day rehabilitation service, rehabilitation in the acute and city views, transitional care. Claire is a manager of rehabilitation in the home and is currently seconded to assist in the development of tele-rehabilitation services at RGH. And her title is tele-rehabilitation post-hospitalisation, more than just a video conference. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for the opportunity to talk today. I'm going to um, talk to you about some of the findings of our telehealth in the home project. And this project uh, was a collaboration between Flinders University and SA Health using a grant from the Commonwealth Government's MBN Pilots Program to investigate whether new models of telehealth service delivery are acceptable to older people using more than a video conference to provide rehab. And today I'm going to just outline our service model and describe some of the technologies that we used. Um, telehealth is not new, and uh, from a considerable evidence base, which was outlined quite nicely this morning, um, including the whole system demonstrator trial, we know that telehealth technologies can support people with long-term healthcare needs. There's less evidence when it comes to rehab. In South Australia, the digital telehealth network, DTN, is established in metropolitan and some regional hospitals. Um, in specifically designed suites, and this is being used mainly for medical assessments, as you just heard, um, or mental health interventions, and involves the need to bring the patient into a particular facility. RDNS uses telehealth technology to manage and monitor chronic disease, and store and forward technologies are being used by a number of disciplines. Traditionally, telehealth approaches have tended to focus on replacing in-person, interview-based uh, assessments and interventions with video conferencing. And there has been a perception that see, it's an improvement from a phone call, but it, it stops short of a proper examination. It's often provided using high-end, highly technical bespoke equipment. And we heard this morning from Trevor Russell about the real exciting developments around um, that. But what it, that might mean is that clinicians who are unfamiliar with telehealth actually feel a little overwhelmed with all of that. So our project, um, for our project, we're hoping to demonstrate that you don't actually have to have highly technical, expensive equipment to deliver rehab. Obviously, if it's available, that's fantastic. But simple, accessible equipment can be used in a lot of cases. We also needed a conceptual shift for our therapists uh, to adapt some of their traditional approaches to therapy. In order to deliver multidisciplinary tele-rehab, we needed to find ways to reproduce movement, desktop and activity-based um, interventions, which would be acceptable to older people who had limited exposure to um, technology. We also hoped that it might be a way to get the dosage we were all after and to provide patients with those tools to empower them to exercise, which we know is important, and to take some control over their own rehab. So our aim was to develop a clinical and technical collaboration using off-the-shelf equipment. The equipment needed to be simple, low-tech, low-cost or affordable. It needed to be accessible and familiar for both clinician and for patient, and the approach needed to be acceptable to the older person. We wanted uh, the person to be able, if they needed to, to purchase it at the local Harvey Norman. So what did we provide? One arm of our project um, provided an eight-week rehab program to people in their own homes. So 72 community living patients with an average age of 73, the oldest being 92, received tele-rehab post a hospitalisation, and 60% of those had had a stroke. Participants were provided with the equipment and internet connection provided. And initially, we were going to use the NBN that was rolling out very slowly in southern Adelaide. Um, and the quality of the connection that we did get um, was fantastic, but the speed at which it was rolling out um, meant that we actually had to find an alternative, so we actually used switch to 3G. We couldn't afford to delay discharge um, of people from hospital for six weeks to await for them to be connected to the internet. So who was suitable? We, we firstly investigated our own usual processes for accepting patients into rehab in the home, 
Um, can they receive rehab at home? Are they going to be safe? Do they have a carer? Is the home suitable? And this, of course, now included, did they have suitable internet access? This is a very busy slide, but basically it's to demonstrate a pathway for those who we thought would have tele-rehab only, and those might be people living in the country. Um, from a very busy flowchart, you can just uh, see three areas of, of pink or red. And basically, they are around uh, care, um, care strain, cognitive um, and or behavioural issues for the patient, and patient self-efficacy. So the red flags don't necessarily disqualify that patient from having their tele-rehab at home, but um, because most of the risks can be modified. But, and the very few patients that we deemed were not suitable for tele-rehab tended to be those with a significant cognitive deficit and no carer. Before they started our program, the patients completed a tool called a technology familiarity tool. And basically, it was just looking at how often they use various types of equipment. It just gave us a background of um, who they were and whether, the, whether or not they were going to be confident. And as you can see, that more than half of them had never searched for information on the internet and had never sent or received emails. The most frequently used technology was, of course, the TV remote control. But we found that technology familiarity had, uh, was not an indicator of whether these people could obtain their goals or participate in the program. So what did we do? We provided people with a 3G cellular enabled iPad, which was configured to look and be as simple as it possibly could. It had only a few icons on the home page, and the patient didn't need to log on or remember a password. All, stands were provided with a, um, all iPads were provided with a stand through which it could be charged, and the stand also enabled the person to very easily carry the iPad around and put it on different surfaces and adjust the angle for the view of the camera. We trialled and looked at a number of commercially available therapeutic apps um, that could be used to support therapy provision, and some great apps were found among thousands. Um, Stroke Link out of Canada and a Parkinson's disease exercise app out of the Netherlands are just two that we found were really up to the gold standard. Patients were provided with a simple instruction manual and with basic hands-on training, as in tap and swipe. How do you open up the video conferencing app? Video conferencing platforms were trialled and we needed simplicity and security, but also the ability to work over low bandwidth. So we ended up using video we were also keen for the patients to have some form of activity monitor, and we wanted something really simple, and there's lots of really expensive gadgets out there that are fantastic. But the Fitbit zips that we could get from Harvey Norman were $60 or $70, and the patient had the ability to set their own goals, um, to see graphs of how well they were doing over periods of a week or a month, um, and they also could get some inspirational comments from the, from the Fitbit app. And the physios and EPs found this to be really a surprisingly popular little piece of equipment, with patients often, um, often wanting to hang on to it at the end of the program, or it mysteriously going missing. Um, thank goodness our iPads didn't disappear too. Uh, during therapy, clinicians may need to show a patient a test, an app, pictures or a text. And initially, this involved holding the item up in front of the video com conferencing camera. Um, it was awkward, and it was... Um, it was difficult to show patients specific details. So a document camera was trialled, and this model was chosen because it connects via USB and powers via the USB. It's uh, got autofocus, and it had good picture quality, and it was easily manipulated over the document to get a good picture. And actually, it was the cheapest model on the market, which met our low-tech, low-cost brief. Also, a patient may need to interact with um, in writing during a therapy session, or they don't understand verbal communication, um, e.g. working with an aphasic um, patient. So usually um, the therapist would provide the pictures in person or um, provide a pad and paper for the person to write down their answers. So what we um, used was an interactive whiteboard, which um, the program of which is called Bayboard, but it allowed the therapist and the patient to write information in free hand, hand it allowed them to download pictures or particular forms for the patient to see and interact with. It was easy to use and there was no login and the patient didn't have to use an email address. And it was free and secure working over an encrypted connect connection. We could also push it out to the patients using our mobile device manager. 
The patient, uh, as you can see in the picture there, is provided with two iPads, so one for the interactive whiteboard and one for the video conference. And the therapist at the other end uses a whiteboard as well, uh, an iPad as well. And so it was used mainly by our speechy and OT. Uh, visual feedback is also uh, a thing that's used quite often by therapists. And at um, we chose um, Bandicam, which is a visual, um, a, a video replay system, because it allowed it to be replayed during our therapy session, and could, so we could give immediate feedback. It was cheap and very easy to use, and it recorded contents of the videos using audio as well, which a lot of the other products didn't have. So that's on, on the desktop in the VC suite and is manipulated using a virtual camera. The virtual camera is something that we found we needed because we were using all of these other programs, applications and camera sources within the one session. Um, we needed a virtual camera, which we chose was ManyCam, and it was, we chose that one because it was, um, it was the other programs were less professional and based on, often based around social media and video creation. Um, ManyCam was cheap, um, well it is at the moment, and very easy to use, and it's um, possible to change between camera sources, zoom in and out, replay videos. Um, we, so during the therapy session we're able to manipulate the video conferencing source, the interactive whiteboard and Bandicam on the one screen and switch between them to show the patient what we wanted them to see. As a lot of therapists in the room will know that we traditionally print off copious amounts of paper copies of exercises for people to do and we wanted to find an electronic alternative that would not only engage the patient but be easy to follow and encourage that homework and therapy dosage. Um, we looked at hundreds and there's some really good ones out there but we decided to develop a specific exercise web app um, that would allow the therapist to manage it remotely. So that means that it's on the patient's um, iPad, but sitting back at Repat, you can change the exercises and it immediately appears on the patient's iPad. And we wanted the patient to be able to access that without any complicated downloads or passwords to put in by the patient. So we filmed um, Otago-type falls and balance, basic exercises for falls and balance, a few upper limb dexterity exercises, speech and swallow, and some amputee exercises. The advantages, obviously, um, with our app were the remote access by the therapist, um, its simplicity, and the realistic videos that we um, took um, of older models. But it's also device agnostic, and it can be left with the patient after we finish. So just some basic results, um, nothing in detail. Um, clinician acceptance is acknowledged as being absolutely essential in the adoption of telehealth as an alternative to traditional to traditional practice, and we've heard how difficult that can be. Initial response from some of our therapists was listing all the things that they couldn't possibly do if they didn't see the patient in person, and they used the perception of risk as a justification. And it, it sometimes appeared to be forgotten that these people are already at home and taking risks every day. There also seemed to be a preconceived idea about older patient acceptance of new technologies. Um, Younger therapists are often, have often got their smartphones permanently attached to part of their body, um, and they were c completely um, tech savvy. They knew exactly what to do with the technology when it was presented themselves, but they interestingly had the same clinical misgivings as the older therapists did. But first-hand experience of using technology brought about an amazing transformation in attitude. And I remember with absolute delight our physio racing up the stairs saying, I just did a bow bath session with my patient and a carer. And she was absolutely thrilled. She felt she'd really got somewhere. And that was something that we never thought we'd be able to do. Um, also, obviously, um, if we go back, the reduction in travel was marked. Um, our wonderful speech therapist um, managed to reduce her travel by at least half and upped her dosage by about three times just through um, doing uh, tele-rehab instead of visiting the person. So we asked the patients at the end of their time um, on the program um, what it is um, that whether they felt that they could use this system. And as you can see by the system usability scale, um, that it was quite strongly in favour of that, that they would like to use the system frequently, that they felt confident using the system. And there were actually very few negatives. 
we spend a lot of time um, focusing on what, how clinicians' time can be saved um, and, and travel can be saved. But what's so important to realise how different it is for the patient. Um, and it, obviously patients that live in the country, it's even more important that they don't have to travel if we can provide services or some of their services like this. They don't have to get their home ready for a home visit. They're able to stay in their PJs if they want to. So it was acceptable to the group that we trialled it with. They were really very happy, apart from one lady with dementia who actually did really well with her rehab, but complained afterwards that if she had known she was going to be on TV, she would have had her hair done. <laughs> so in conclusion, tele-rehab can be delivered to post-acute patients in South Australia utilising a combination of video conferencing, ele electronic tools, therapeutic and remote monitoring applications. But, and it's a big but, access to reliable internet connection remains a real challenge for patients, particularly those in the country where 3G black spots abound. If the internet is available, then tele-rehab can be a superior alternative, providing increased access, increased frequency and intensity of therapy. The fear and trepidation that clinicians and patients may feel towards new technology can be mitigated in part if the technology is simple and familiar and cheap and easily accessible. So we have experienced that tele-rehab is so much more than a video conference. 